Meanwhile, more than a year into the war, and despite all the sanctions and bad press, the Russians seem to be doing quite okay. The West's economic weapon has neither isolated nor demolished the Russian economy. In fact, according to the assessment of Western agencies, Russia is growing faster than the UK, and Russia's ultra-rich are getting richer. Look at the kind of money they're making. In 2022, Russian billionaires were worth $353 billion. $353 billion. In 2023, that is this year, their wealth went up to $505 billion. That's an increase of $152 billion. And this is despite the sanctions and the war. The wealth of an average Russian billionaire has gone up by around $600 million. And their number has gone up too. Look at the latest Forbes list. In 2022, there were 88 Russian billionaires on the list. This year, there, there are 110. So during the war, 22 Russian billionaires have been added to the Forbes list. If these numbers appear mind-boggling, wait till you hear the next ones. The Forbes list includes sanctioned Russian billionaires as well. Do you know how many there are? 46. 46 out of 110 are sanctioned individuals. They're blacklisted by the US, the UK and the European Union, but their wealth is growing. How did this happen? What's driving the wealth of Russians? We made a list of factors that are at play. And first among them are the sanctions themselves. They're supposed to punish individuals or entities, but the impact of sanctions is overestimated. The second factor at play is the rise in commodity prices. Russia's richest make most of their money from selling commodities. I'm talking about things like oil, metals, and natural resources. They became expensive after the war. The war and the sanctions led to shortages, so the prices went up, and the Russian oligarchs milked this crisis. Their businesses remained immune to the sanctions, and they kept making money. In fact, the rich list has more clues. The new Russian billionaires came from a wide variety of businesses. They have made their money in snacks, supermarkets, chemicals, and pharmaceuticals. And these are businesses driven by domestic demand, and this is another sign the Russian economy is still working because domestic demand remains high. Russians are still spending money. Remember, this is not the first time they're facing economic sanctions. A lot of them have seen this before. In 1974, for instance, the U.S. wanted to punish Soviet Russia. President Gerald Ford was in the White House then, and he wanted to punish Moscow over human rights, so he imposed trade restrictions. They were called the jackson vanik Amendment. Then, in the late 1970s, the Jimmy Carter administration sanctioned the Soviet Union. This was over the war in Afghanistan. These sanctions ranged from a grain embargo to export controls on technology, also restrictions on bilateral cooperation and a boycott at the Olympics. To some extent, the isolation campaign worked. But this time, it's not working. Since the war began in Ukraine, the West has slapped over 11,000 sanctions. More than 11,000 in a year. They've frozen some $300 billion of Russia's foreign reserves. But how much has it helped? Russian billionaires are still making money and the Russian economy is still growing. Like I said, it's doing better than the UK. That's what the IMF said earlier this year. That Russia is doing better than the UK. So have the sanctions failed completely? Well, yes, if we look at their political goal, Russia is neither isolated nor persuaded to end the war. You see, the goal of sanctions is to change the behavior of nation states. That's one measure of their success. And on that count, the sanctions against Russia have failed. And Australia isn't the only country reassessing its defense priorities. South Korea is doing the same. It has two difficult neighbors, North Korea and China, and Seoul is debating an old but urgent question. Should it have nuclear weapons? So far, they've relied on America's support, their so-called nuclear security umbrella. But can it be trusted anymore? South Korea is not very sure about Washington's commitment. Its president, Yoon suk Yeol, is on a visit to the U.S., his first as president. And his agenda is quite clear. He wants solid assurances from the White House. Given North Korea's nuclear threats and missile testing spree, can the South count on America's nuclear arsenal or should it acquire its own? Our next report has more. Tensions are rising in the Korean Peninsula. North Korea is firing missiles like there's no tomorrow. Pyongyang calls them tests, meant to deter its supposed enemies. Countries in the region are anxious. 
Japan recently had to issue emergency evacuation orders for its citizens in Hokkaido. The reason behind the scare? A North Korean long-range missile. So the situation in the region is volatile, which is why South Korean President Yoon Suk-yeol is on a state visit to the United States. He boarded a flight for Washington today and will be in the U.S. for the next five days. President Joe Biden is going to host him for a high-stakes summit. It's a summit that could decide the fate of relations between both these nations. And South Korea has some big asks. It is questioning America's commitment to its security. It is unsure whether Washington would intervene in case a conflict with North Korea or China breaks out. Seoul needs to be prepared for a nuclear attack from North Korea. Technically, some vague American promises are already in place. Washington even has a term for them. It's called extended deterrence. Basically, South Korea is eligible to be protected under the American nuclear umbrella. But that's not enough for Seoul. It wants a bigger say in operating the USA's extended deterrence assets. Seoul says both sides are working to make the deterrence more concrete. Reports say President Biden would pledge quote-unquote substantial steps to deter a North Korean nuclear attack. They're said to be working on a joint document too. It outlines the conditions for the U.S. to retaliate with nuclear weapons if South Korea is attacked. If this document sees the light of day, it will be the first time that the U.S. promises nuclear retaliation in a written document. And South Korea will be the first non-NATO ally to get such a written assurance. The joint document could even include a significant provision, one which allows for the deployment of American nuclear assets on the Korean Peninsula at the request of South Korea. The nuclear debate was reignited in January when President Yoon made a startling suggestion. He argued that it was time for South Korea to develop nuclear weapons. Pretty soon he backtracked, but by then, as they say, the cat was out of the bag. Public sentiment was in favor of having nukes. Polls say more than 70% of South Koreans want their country to develop nuclear weapons. Another poll found that 54% of the respondents do not trust America's assurances. They said the U.S. would not risk its own safety to protect South Korea. So the U.S. must assure that it's not making empty promises and that it's willing to stand by and defend its allies. It has a lot of damage control to do. Highly classified American documents have made their way to the public domain. They show how Washington has been spying on allies, including South Korea. Seoul has not publicly condemned the Americans for this, but the issue may come up in private conversations. Imagine this. You're at work. You've come up with the next big idea. It's the kind of idea that will guarantee you a promotion. So you write it down, complete with your notes and a PowerPoint presentation, and just before your presentation, someone spills water on your laptop. I'm sure some of you have been there. Guess who's joined your club now? Xi Jinping, the president of China. He had a grand plan to broker peace in Ukraine, to be called the peacemaker. But one of his wolf warriors has poured water on it. We're talking about the man on your screen, Lu Shai. He's China's ambassador in Paris, and he's in the headlines for an interview. An interview where he talked about former Soviet states. More than 30 years back, when the USSR broke up, 15 new countries were formed. Today, the world recognizes them as independent nations. But the Chinese ambassador said they're not independent. And this statement has triggered a storm. China has a diplomatic crisis on its hands. At least four European states have protested. Baltic states are furious. Chinese diplomats are scrubbing traces of that interview. And China's so-called Ukraine peace plan is in tatters. Tonight, we'll discuss all of it, starting with the interview. Ambassador Liu of China spoke to a French news network, and the Chinese side shared a full transcript of the interview, both in Mandarin and French. But if you look for it now, you won't find it. Because the Chinese embassy in France has taken it down. We looked for it too. No trace. But from other sources, we've managed to access some quotes. The interviewer asked Ambassador Liu about the war in Ukraine, also about the status of Crimea. Crimea is a peninsula that Russia took from Ukraine in the year 2014. 
So the Chinese ambassador was asked a very straight, basic question. Is Crimea a part of Ukraine? And here's how he responded. I'm quoting. It depends on how you perceive the problem. There is a history. Crimea was originally Russian. It was Khrushchev who offered Crimea to Ukraine during the period of the Soviet Union. That's how it began. And Ambassador Lu just made it worse as he completed the answer. Let me quote again. Even these ex-Soviet Union countries do not have effective status, as we say, under international law because there is no international accord to concretize their status as a sovereign country. Let that sink in. And do remember, this is not a slip of tongue. Ambassador Liu very clearly said former Soviet states are not independent and that their sovereignty has not been recognized under international law. This is a top Chinese diplomat questioning the sovereignty of 15 countries. No wonder China is facing a severe backlash from Europe. The strongest reactions have come from the Baltic states, Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia. All three were part of the Soviet Union and all three have summoned the top Chinese diplomat in their country. Latvia has called the comments, quote unquote, completely unacceptable. Estonia said China's position, and I'm quoting again, is incomprehensible. And Lithuania went a step ahead. Its foreign minister said they don't trust China, especially when it comes to brokering peace in Ukraine. And backing them is the EU's top diplomat, Joseph Borrell. He called the Chinese statement, and I'm quoting, unacceptable. Even Ukraine has weighed in. Remember, President Zelensky wanted to speak to Xi Jinping. He wanted to discuss the Chinese peace plan. He even invited the Chinese president to visit Kiev. But all of that may change now. Here's what Ukraine's ambassador to France has said. Text question, who owns Crimea, is revealing as usual. Next time... It will be good to expand who owns Vladivostok. Such comments are still coming in. It is totally and totally unacceptable. We are denouncing uh, such a statement and I hope that the uh, bosses of this ambassador will make things straight. Uh, well, first of all, it's completely unacceptable. Uh, and uh, later today, uh, three Baltic states uh, will be summoning uh, representatives, in our case, the Charge Affairs in other capitals is the ambassador, to ask for clarification. Has Chinese uh, position changed uh, on, the, on the independence? And to remind him that uh, we are not post-Soviet countries, we are the countries that were illegally occupied by Soviet Union. China needs to tell us that the position of the ambassador in Paris is not the official position of China. China is in damage control mode. And their biggest worry is France. The French president, remember, went out on a limb to back Beijing. He went to China earlier this month. He tried to get China to broker peace in Ukraine. And for doing this, he got a lot of brickbats from Europe. But after a statement like this one, will Macron still be able to bat for China? Will he be in a position to bat for China? Paris has said it was dismayed by Ambassador Liu's comments. Listen to this. We learn with dismay of the remarks of the Chinese ambassador to France concerning the borders of the countries which became independent with the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991. It is up to China to say whether these remarks reflect its position, which we hope not. China took the cue. It tried to distance itself from the comments of its ambassador. After the dissolution of the Soviet Union, China was one of the first countries to establish diplomatic ties with relevant countries. Since the establishment of diplomatic ties, China has always adhered to the principles of mutual respect and equal treatment to develop bilateral, friendly and cooperative relations. The Chinese side respects the status of the member states as sovereign states after the dissolution of the Soviet Union. But it's a very poor face saver. Because look at the man whose words China is trying to disown. He's a repeat offender, yet a top diplomat. Ambassador Liu belongs to a special category of Chinese diplomats called wolf warriors. They specialize in an aggressive and combative style of diplomacy. And Liu has a long history of doing this. Last year, he gave another controversial interview. It was when U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan. Ambassador Liu called for the re-education of Taiwan. And in China, re-education is code for persecution. It's what the state does in Xinjiang. They've locked up more than a million Uyghurs in the name of re-education, and these people are now being forced to pledge loyalty to the Communist Party. Ambassador Liu suggested the same for Taiwan. 
Then at the height of the pandemic, Lou's embassy published a blog. It was about the Western response to the pandemic. The blog said the West handled the virus recklessly. It talked about France too, the country where he's stationed. And it said that health workers left the elderly in nursing homes to die. What a claim to make. So Ambassador Lu tends to wade into controversy. But this is not the problem of an individual. It's about the system that he represents. That's what's problematic. China practices what he's saying. It tries to push a flawed interpretation of history, a version that suits Beijing, that benefits the Communist Party. China tries to impose its worldview, and its ambassador is only taking that forward. In 2021, Xi Jinping delivered a speech. He said, no history, love the party. That's exactly what his foot soldiers are doing now. In Pakistan, another audio leak is making waves. It features two women, Mehjabeen Noon and Rafia Tariq. One is the mother-in-law of the Chief Justice of Pakistan. The other is the wife of a lawyer for the Pakistan tehreek e insaf Party. That's Imran Khan's party. So the Chief Justice's mother-in-law is set to be talking to the wife of an opposition lawyer. Whichever way you look at it, it's a murky affair. And questions are being asked on all sides. It's making national headlines. The government supporters ask, why was this conversation taking place at all? The opposition asks, why was this conversation being recorded and why has it been leaked? Now, let me give you some context. The Chief Justice of Pakistan is hearing some important cases and they involve the government. The judge recently gave an order to the Election Commission of Pakistan. He said elections in the Punjab province must be held on the 14th of May. This order was widely seen as a blow to the government because the government wanted the provincial elections to be delayed. Now, if it turns out that a very close relative of the Chief Justice is talking to someone from the opposition camp, it sparks accusations of bias, especially when you go through the contents of the conversation. Listen to this. It does sound quite conspiratorial, but there's a catch. We don't know if this audio clip is genuine, which brings us to the opposition's questions. Who recorded and leaked this audio clip? And who stands to gain from the leak? The Pakistani government is having a field day. Its ministers are spreading the clip on social media. Interior Minister Rana Sanaula has demanded a forensic audit. He said if the clip is fabricated, those involved will be punished. But here's what he said next. And let me quote from his statement. But if the clip is real, then accountability should be sought from those behind these conversations and the person about whom the conversation is should resign. Those who were mentioned in the audio, they should show grace and step down. And that's where it gets tricky. A judge is ruling against the government of Pakistan. Suddenly an audio clip surfaces that shows the judge in poor light and ministers are already asking for his resignation without proof that the clip is, is real. It's led to the usual round of finger pointing and of course the usual furor. Opposition leader and PTI member Fawad Chaudhry has raised this. He said, no move is being made to address the constant audio leaks in Pakistan. And now in ho even housewives are becoming victims to the leaks. He also said that illegally tapping calls is a punishable offence. All very sanctimonious. Never mind the fact that the PTI was happy to jump on leaks when it suited them. You see, Pakistani audio leaks started last September. The private conversations of various high-profile leaders have been leaked. And this list includes Prime Minister Shehbaz Sharif, 
former Prime Minister Imran Khan and the ruling coalition's Maryam Nawaz. So the leaks are spread across Pakistan's political spectrum. They take place at the highest of levels and whenever they come out, the other side is always quick to take advantage. From sleazy phone call allegations against Imran Khan to talks about buying lawmakers or Maryam Nawaz making deaths look like accidents. Pakistan's audio leaks apparently have it all. No wonder the law does not seem to deter the leakers. And it also makes you question the security apparatus. Honestly, what are they doing? How are high-profile politicians falling victim to unlawful phone tapping? Is it incompetence or connivance from the security forces? Well, whatever the case, the rot in Pakistani politics continues to get more foul. And now, as Fawad Chaudhary said, even housewives aren't safe. In Australia, a major shake-up is underway, the biggest military reform of the decade. Canberra has released a new defence policy today. The paper says the world has changed and Australia's defence forces are not fully prepared to tackle the challenges of today. We confront the most challenging strategic circumstances since the Second World War, both in our region and indeed around the world. That's why we're investing in our capabilities and we're investing in our relationships to build a more secure Australia and a more stable and prosperous region. Who is Prime Minister Albanese referring to? He's talking about China. The report does not mention China, but the implication is clear. Australia is worried about the South China Sea and Beijing sweeping claims on it. This is a disputed region. China claims all of it. Now, Australia believes Beijing's claims, and I'm quoting, threaten the global rules-based order in the Indo-Pacific in a way that adversely impacts Australia's national interests. So they see China as a threat. And what do they plan to do about it? Firm up their defences. Reassess their priorities. Effectively, this review is about military spending, about where and how Australia spends its defence budget which is reworking its priorities and redirecting these funds. The first big change is this one. Australia wants more long-range missiles. Earlier, it relied on more land-based weapons, but today's report points to a hard shift. Australia will buy more missiles. And what kind of missiles will these be? Those with the ability to target beyond 500 kilometres and to do so with great precision. Australia now views its military threats differently. The new defence policy says Australia can no longer be protected by its geographic isolation. We now live in the missile age, so the Australian forces need to prepare for that. Reports say some weapons programs will be done away with. One of them is an infantry fighting vehicle project. It will be scaled back. Instead, they'll focus on weapons with long-range capabilities. These are weapons that can strike ships at sea, like HIMARS and army landing crafts. So these are the tactical changes. What about the political changes? The new defence policy also talks about alliances. Australia wants to work more closely with its partners, countries like India. In fact, the report does talk about India. Here's what it says, and I'm quoting, Australia also needs to continue to expand its relationships and practical cooperation with key powers, including Japan and India, and invest in regional architecture. For military planning, in terms of our strategic geography, the primary area of military interest for Australia's national defence is the immediate region encompassing the northeastern Indian Ocean through maritime Southeast Asia into the Pacific. This is the area Australia is interested in. It has some key shipping and trade routes, and Australia needs them open to ensure its economic security. So there are clear conclusions in this report and important takeaways. For Australia, working with allies like India is now a priority, and China is a clear threat of course, Beijing is not thrilled about this assessment. I want to emphasize that China has always pursued a defensive national defense policy. We are committed to maintaining peace and stability in the Asia-Pacific and the world. We do not pose a threat to any country. We hope that some countries would stop using China as an excuse to boost their military and don't hype up baseless Chinese threat theories. Well, that's China being China. Australia has not responded to this yet. It plans to spend a total of $19 billion over a period of four years. I have news for you, and for a change, it's not about war or an impending recession or a virus. It's more personal, and it's good news. First Post has crossed 1 million subscribers on YouTube. In our world of more than 8 billion people, this may seem like a very small number, but for me and my team, 
It means a lot, more than we can put in words. And I'm here to thank you for your support because this has been a very special journey, both personally and professionally. In a country with 400 news channels, who needs another news platform? We asked ourselves this question every day as we put together the show for you. Why should you watch us? Why should you subscribe to us? We think of this every day. When we started in January, we had less than 200,000 subscribers. It was a very, very small base, but you cheered us from the word go. We launched Vantage on the 26th of January this year, and you joined our journey. In a post-pandemic world, going viral can be a tricky affair, but trust me when I say this, we are not complaining about this virality. You watched and shared our stories, and they started coming back to us. It's the biggest prize, I say. If you think I'm getting carried away, please bear with me. Like I said, this has been special. It's been a learning curve. Because we knew, knew our stories, we understood our subjects, but we were getting used to the medium. You helped us with feedback and so many comments. Thank you for writing. You told us what won't work and what we shouldn't be doing. Thank you for critiquing. And you kept coming back every day to watch us. Thank you for watching and subscribing. We hear you, so keep the conversation going. We truly believe that in this day and age, time is more valuable than anything. And you give us your time. We are committed to making it worthwhile, to highlighting India's perspective on global issues, to tracking developments that shape our world, to reading between the lines and to telling stories that really matter. In the weeks and months ahead, we will bring you more shows. We are entering a very exciting phase. We want to experiment. We want to take you where the story is. You know, they're right when they say that storytelling is the most powerful way to put ideas in the world today. And you help us hone that skill. So thank you for making us one million strong. I say, we're only getting started.